It's been 44 years, since the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire, and the mystery remains. Many believe that the truth has never been revealed. Over the last several years, never-before-seen photos have been shared. Calls for a new investigation have been made, all, to no avail. From faulty aluminum wiring to the mob, you can find almost any theory to satisfy your curiosity. After years of research, this documentary presents the conclusion that the fire, was in fact, an inside job. The 1970s ushered in a new era of entertainment. Theater audiences were terrified by disaster movies like The Poseidon Adventure, Airport 1975 and, The Towering Inferno. On May 28, 1977 at 8.30 p.m. a real disaster was about to unfold in the small northern Kentucky town of Southgate. The Beverly Hills Supper Club, located at the top of a hill, in the small town of Southgate, Kentucky, was known as the showplace of the nation. For several years, it would be an extremely popular establishment, which was famous for great food, fine wine, lavish facilities, and first-class entertainment. The club offered meeting and banquet facilities for groups of 20 to 1,000 people. The central hallway was adorned with mirrors. It featured a curved open staircase that was known as the Cinderella Stairway. Billed as the show place of the nation, the Beverly Hills Supper Club lived up to the hype. It was one of the most lavish clubs of the time and was the largest between Las Vegas and the East Coast. Owner of the Beverly Hills Supper Club, Mr. Richard Schilling was well known for his spending on expensive decorations to adorn the club. From the floor coverings to the chandeliers, only the best would do. The showplace of the nation lived up to its reputation. Renovations and additions to the club were ongoing through the 1970s. By 1977, the club had grown to a little over 65,000 square feet. Most of the club was a one-story structure, that was 240 feet wide and 260 feet deep. A 3,000 square foot second story, was located above the main bar and the front of the structure. A partial basement was also located under this portion of the club. Kentucky Building Code classified the structure as non-combustible, as it was an assembly of steel framing, masonry walls, poured concrete floors, and a steel deck roofing system. However, the original plaster ceilings were covered by suspended ceilings with mineral tiles throughout most of the building. Interior partition walls, were of wood construction. The second floor was constructed of wood walls and wood floor joists with plywood flooring. This included the area above the zebra room. The interior of the club was lavishly decorated with wood paneling, carpet and draperies, all of which were, highly flammable. Multiple violations of the National Electric Code were present throughout the structure including, failure to install an electrical box at wiring junctions, failure to secure electrical boxes and fittings, failure to place wiring and metal conduit, excessive number of conductors and electrical boxes, improper transformer installations, failure to close unused openings in electrical boxes, the lack of exits, blocking of vials, overcrowding of the club and lack of emergency evacuation training by the staff were all pieces that would complete a tragic puzzle. In addition, the National Fire Code violations included, the lack of fire stopping, failure to post occupant loads and improper use of the building. Kentucky state law required 27.5 exits to be available to patrons and staff. On the night of May 28, 1977 only 16.5 exits existed. Not all were visible to patrons and no exit led directly to the exterior of the building. Poor construction practices were commonplace at the club. Carpeting, wall coverings and light fixtures were lavish. Behind the glitz and glamour of the furnishings was a cheap, poorly constructed skeleton of a building. On the night of May 28, 1977, all of these factors would combine, when an amateur arsonist, started a small fire that would create perfect conditions for a nightmare. On that night, the staff of the Beverly Hills Supper Club were busy preparing for the largest crowd of the year. Popular entertainer, John Davidson, was set to perform that Memorial Day weekend. An arsonist was also preparing for a performance, a performance that did not go as planned. The club was filled far beyond capacity that evening. Possibly as many as three times the seating chart limits. The owners didn't turn away paying guests. Extra chairs filled the aisles, extra tables were squeezed into the cabaret room. As patrons filed into the room to take their seats, no one could have imagined, how this night would end. 165 people would die, most in that very showroom. Arsonists are motivated by financial gain, anger, and or revenge. This documentary submits that, the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire was the result of an angry amateur arsonist, an individual who understood neither the dynamics of fire, nor how it would feed and grow when fueled by the poor construction and highly flammable furnishings of the club. The goal of the arsonist, to set a nuisance fire. 
a fire, significant enough to evacuate the club, to ruin business, on the biggest night of the year. Trash can fires in the bathrooms were common at the club, these were extinguished by employees without evacuation, or the need to contact the Southgate Fire Department. This knowledge led the arsonist on a search to locate a better breeding ground, for a fire that would evacuate the structure. Unfortunately, the concealed space where the fire was set was surrounded by combustible materials and had a good source of air, to fuel the fire. Unknown to him, he had chosen the perfect location for a small fire, to become a raging inferno in only a matter of minutes. On the evening of May 28, the arsonist intended to set a fire, that would produce enough smoke and flames, to cause a full building evacuation. A nuisance fire, revenge, for poor working conditions, unfair pay, feelings that provoked enough anger, to finally send the arsonist over the edge. With weeks of frustration built up inside the arsonist, this was his night to set revenge into motion. Likely planned for days or weeks, with working knowledge of the building layout, the arsonist reported for work his normal and went about his scheduled task. Access to the club's room schedule for the night, was critical. Approximately 3,500 filled the Beverly Hills Supper Club that evening. In the cabaret room alone, 1,500 people occupied a space, designed to hold fewer than 600 people. In reserved rooms, a retirement party and a bar mitzvah were taking place. A wedding party was held in the zebra room earlier in the evening. The knowledge, that the zebra room would be vacant by 8.30 p.m. was a key factor in the planning of the location of the fire. In the days before the fire, the future arsonist sought out an access panel. He had heard other employees discuss. This access panel was located in the Hollywood-like facade on the front of the building. The facade and access panel were constructed during one of the 1970 renovations. The new facade gave the building a fresh, more glamorous look and covered the building's original and dated appearance. It also concealed an old window, a window that was in the zebra room. Not only was the window covered by the exterior facade, but it was not visible from the inside of the zebra room because a fake fireplace had been installed in the old window opening. Once the aspiring arsonist found this panel at the base of the facade, all he had to do was crawl through to find a perfectly secret haven in which to conduct his crime. A perfect location to drop in an accelerant. The fireplace had been poorly installed, leaving multiple gaps and openings in the wall structure. The old window opening provided an easy way to access the area between the original brick wall of the club and the interior wood framing of the zebra room. Around 8.30 p.m., the soon-to-be amateur arsonist, took a break from his nightly duties at the club. The club was busy, so travel to the exterior of the building would be easily accomplished, without attracting anyone's attention. It was already getting dark, as sunset was to fall at 8.54 p.m., he crawled through the access panel into the concealed space behind the facade. Once inside, an arsonist was born, all that was necessary was to start a fire in the concealed space, between the brick exterior wall of the club and the wood-framed walls of the zebra room. Once the fire was lit, the arsonist returned to work and waited. In his plan, it would not be long, until the fire would be noticed, and the club evacuated. The Southgate Fire Department would arrive, and the interruption to the events, would prove a significant financial loss to the owners. It was business as usual, and the plan was executing perfectly. Revenge would soon be served, as the main course, at the Beverly Hills Supper Club. The concealed space, between the walls and the ceiling, provided a haven for the fire to grow in. By 8.55 p.m. the fire, had outgrown its hidden space. It required additional room to survive. After consuming everything available in the concealed space, the fire started to devour the zebra room. At this point, it was discovered by a waitress. As she opened the doors of the zebra room, a supply of fresh air rushed in, and flashover occurred. At this point, the fire, was unstoppable. Flames burst from the zebra room, and raced along the corridor to the overcrowded cabaret room. At 9.02 p.m. the first call for help was received at the Southgate Fire Department. FBI reports indicate the fire was brought under control seven hours later, but not before 165 individuals died inside the structure, 163 of them, in their efforts to escape the cabaret room. The zebra room, was constructed of highly flammable wall coverings over wood wall construction and a combustible drop ceiling. The floor of the room consisted of a 4-inch thick concrete slab over metal decking and steel bar joist. The only openings in the floor were for HVAC ductwork. These openings were exploited by the fire and allowed burning materials to be deposited in the basement. 
small fires started in the basement below the openings in the concrete floor slab. Witness statements that were collected after the fire, provided a wealth of false information. People tend to interject information into the chronicles of a disaster, so that their account can reach the history books. These bits of information, have no credibility, and in this case, none have ever been verified or proven in any way. Some of the many stories that have surfaced over time. A cleaning crew, that wiped flammable liquids on the walls of the club, in the days before the fire. The crew of women were even reported to have brought children with them. Another story said that two repair men, were said to be in the club on the day of the fire, possibly working on the HVAC system, in the ceiling above the zebra room. Most dramatic of all, is the theory that, the mob hired the cleaning crew and the repair men. People involved in organized crime are professionals. If the mob wanted to burn the club down, they would have done it in the middle of the night, not with thousands of witnesses. A recurring assertion is that, the fire started in the basement. Photos of the basement. Taken after the fire. Clearly show this was not true. Undamaged cardboard boxes can easily be seen in the photos with only a small amount of fire damage visible. FBI reports indicate that agents confiscated several antique roulette wheels from the basement after the fire. Remnants of the club's casino operations in the past. No doubt, some of the electrical wiring in the basement did not meet the National Electric Code. But photos. After the fire. Clearly show. That less than legal wiring examples remain intact after the fire. Reports of black smoke coming from the eaves and roof of the building as early at 5 p.m. Had been told for years. Again. With no verifiable proof. On the night of the fire. No one turned away from the club. Or made any reports to anyone about visible smoke from the roof. Who was the arsonist? An angry employee made a decision to start a nuisance fire. With no understanding of the mechanics of fire. No understanding of how poorly the club was constructed. No consideration that his creation, a nuisance fire, could become a killing inferno in a very short time span. What he started, was a fire that burns to this day. We will likely never know who the arsonist was. Perhaps a male in his late teens or early twenties, he worked at the club, he had issues with management, he sought revenge, he walked among other employees every night, he kept his anger to himself, he had a front row seat to the disaster that he created and, since the fire, the motivation to remain silent, is overwhelming, the fear of prosecution for causing 165 fatalities, will keep him silent, and will haunt him for the rest of his life. His identity will likely remain a mystery, for all eternity. Thank you for watching, Inside Job. The Beverly Hills Supper Club Fire. This has been a production of Code 3 Images.